Edgar, wake up. That's right, everybody. Today, I'm explaining multiverse theory to my Don. Yeah. Are you awake? Yeah. So, this is not going to be an educational video. Do not take what I say as facts. It's just a way for me to see if I understand it. Then I should at least be able to explain it. Right, Edgar? And I think it's really freaking cool. So hopefully this will spark some interest for other people rather than me saying, Okay, this is how it is. Don't do that. Don't listen to me. I'm just explaining to my dog. But, you know, we're all familiar with multiverse theory. We've all heard about it in some sort of sci-fi movie or regular movie in general. They always come up. Everyone knows about it. But I want to understand how does it actually work? What's the actual idea behind it being theoretically possible? So, I found the experience of trying to understand multiverse theory extremely annoying. Because what would happen was new terms that I, you know, I have no base knowledge of these things, but new terms would always come up while trying to understand something. So I have to look up what that means, and while looking up what that means, another term comes up, and I have to look up what that means, and then when I look up what that means, another term comes up, and then I have to look up what that means, and I'm just getting further and further and further away from actually understanding anything. But, that ends now. The goal of this video, it might not be the most perfect explanation, but I want anyone to watch this and try and understand as well. That's my goal. We're gonna keep this simple, baby. And we're gonna keep this crystal clear, so even my dumb dog Edgar understands. You are watching this video now, but end the video, if you make it through, you're gonna be like, Huh, I get it. I get multiverse theory. That's what we're doing. Now, I said that I got really frustrated, but in reality, a lot of these things that annoyed me at first turn out to be really, really cool concepts and ideas that I actually found really, really interesting. So trying to understand multiverse theory and, uh, and all that has actually been really, really fun. I love doing this and this video is more of me being excited and wanting to talk about it. So take it as that. Again, not an instructional video. So, uh, multiverse theory uh, is generally, as far as I understand, divided into th four levels. So there's level one, level two, level three, level four. And I don't think there's a specific reason to why they're called levels. It's not like you have to level, go from one level to another. It's just a way to separate all these different ideas. So we're gonna start off with level one, and I'm gonna stop at level three. But they're amazing, and it's super fascinating. So let's start off with level one. Level 1, you're probably already familiar with in some sense. It's the first one I have ever heard about. And it's the idea that our universe, or if there's infinite universe or infinite space, since you exist by mere chance, if a space out there is infinite, then by mere probability, sheer probability, there will have to be another one of you eventually out there. It's sort of picturing that our universe is a random structure of particles that just happened to be. And it's just a matter of, okay, well, how far would you have to then travel for the probability of another same set of uh, particles uh, being structured in the same sense? I remember hearing about this multiverse theory in, uh, I don't know if you've seen this movie, The Beach, where Leo is like making kind of, let's see what he says. I mean, there are infinite worlds out there, you know, where anything you want to happen does happen. Richard, you know something? Hmm. This is just the kind of pretentious bullshit the Americans always say to French girls, so they can sleep with them. Shut up, mate! It's cool. It's cool, right? It's cool. It's cool to imagine the idea that another version of you is out there. Right, Edgar? It's also kind of hopeful in a way, you know? If things is sh here, at least in another universe, someone else is doing way better off. We can only hope I'm in the good universe, right? You're having a great time, aren't you? Yeah, do you understand? <laughs> so this is generally seen as the least controversial idea of a multiverse. So picturing space and how big it is is something I wasn't really familiar with. Apparently the way we distinguish it, it seems like I just didn't pay attention in school at all, but apparently the way we distinguish our universe is what we call our observable universe. And it's basically how far light has traveled since Big Bang. Anything beyond that we can't see because light hasn't reached those uh, areas yet. And it's, it spans 42 billion light years. 
So even though you try and imagine infinite space, to me that makes more sense that the universe is infinite, because if it's finite, then what the f*** is beyond the edge of the finite? Huh? Is, is there just a sign that says, hey, space ends here, stop here, can't go further. But I guess in, in a sense we do have that with our observable universe, but we do imagine that whatever is outside our observable universe is just like space inside our universe. Cool. Great. Uh, Max actually did a really cool experiment. Max Tegmark, the I think he's the one that categorized multiverse theory into these levels. And he actually did a calculation to see, okay, if we are just random particle structured, how far would we then have to travel to reach another multiverse in an identical parallel universe? Rather, sorry. Uh, and he came up with the number 10 to the 10 to the then raised 118. Is that meters? It doesn't sound that far, right? You imagine that 4 times 10 to raised our universe is 4 times 10 to raised 26. That doesn't sound far at all. That's 14 billion light years. You try and imagine that number? <laughs> you can't. You just can't possibly even picture how far that is. But it is kind of cool that you can imagine how far to travel for another universe. There's a good picture to draw for our observable universe. Moving on. Everyone satisfied with multi-layer or one multiverse theory? Yeah? Random? It's kind of weird to imagine that you exist by sheer probability, right? I don't like the thought that much, to be honest. So, universe big, anything can happen. That's basically your level one multiverse. Oh, your tongue is out. Now, are you ready for multiverse level two? I think this is where it gets really uh, interesting. So level two uses uh, this fantastic discovery that I had never heard about. I wonder if now that probably a lot of you who are younger than me are learning about this in school, but it's a cosmic microwave background, which is basically a um, sort of map of our universe. It's the oldest radiation that exists in our universe, and they dated it back to 380,000 years uh, after the Big Bang. So discovering this cosmic microwave background, also it's a great proof for that the Big Bang did happen, even though there are already uh, many things, evidence for it, okay? Then we're not here to debate that. But the cosmic microwave background is the sort of thing that just gives a, a lot of information about our universe. But it also gave us information that sort of makes things difficult to understand uh, Big Bang. <laughs> You're so cute, look at you. So, while uh, examining the cosmic microwave background, scientists discovered two fatal flaws, or, or, or big problems, that are very perplexing. Uh, and the first one is the horizon problem. And I, don't, I don't know, I just think this is so interesting. Uh, so, if you look at the cosmic microwave background, and you take a look at two opposite ends of it, then you're looking at two opposite ends of the universe. Uh, and what pe what they realized was that these two uh, different ends of the universe are way too uniform by the decimal to the decimal to the decimal. I don't know how to express it, but they are so uniform that they would have had to been in contact at some point. It's kind of like how you mix two fluids uh, together, right? You mix G fuel with powder. Eventually, it finds a uniform taste. <laughs> this is the greatest example I've ever done. <laughs> Can you sit still? I'm trying to explain to you. So this is the horizon problem, but the real problem about this is that to travel in between them, they are so far away that it would take longer to travel between them than the universe have ever existed. So theoretically, it's impossible for these to be that far apart. So how can two pieces of the universe be so uniform alike that they would have have to been close at some point and be so far away? Focus. So that's one issue. The other issue is the flatness problem, which I really struggle with, and I think I've learned everything about it, and at the end of the day, all you really have to understand is the universe is really flat. <laughs> In fact, it's so flat that it's puzzling just how flat it is. That's the flatness problem. And I don't want to know, I don't know how much detail I should get into this. It's one of those things where I just went around in circles and like, what the? What does flat mean? How can the universe be flat? I don't really understand any of this. 
I don't know what the best way to explain it either. There's a bunch. Hello? Hello? So, I guess all you need to know, in scientific terms, without complicating things too much, there's something called the density perimeter. It's this uh, omega sign that you see. And it sort of helps us determine what the shape of the universe is. The density perimeter is based on, I think, gravity and mass. The density perimeter is the ratio of the average density of matter and energy in the universe to the critical density. Oh, thank you. I totally understand what that means. To be honest, the math behind it, we're not going to understand, so it doesn't really matter. What you do have to understand is that if this density perimeter is bigger than one, the universe shape will be a, a sphere-like. If it's smaller than one, the shape of the universe uh, will be bent like a struch. I don't know what it's called. And if this is one, it's flat. Universe is, it means universe is flat. So, I gotta be honest, I'm not 100% sure I understand this, okay? But they draw this example when, with the uh, triangles, right? If you add up all the angles of the triangle and it's uh, 180 degrees, then that means it's flat, right? If it's bigger or smaller, then that means the universe have these two shapes. And I suppose you can do that with the a, with a CMB data of picking points that are very far away in the universe and sort of tell if the angles add up. Does that make sense? I'm not, I, I gotta be honest, I'm not entirely sure if that, that's exactly how they do it, but that makes sense in my head at least. Because things can appear to us as flat, like this picture D here, even though they are a sphere. So we need data that are, are really far away, and I suppose you can do that with the cosmic microwave background because it spans, it maps our universe. But the problem is, I suppose, what they found is that the universe is super flat. Uh, what would have been cool if the universe wasn't flat is that we could actually calculate the size because we would know the curvature. And by that logic, you can then calculate the size of the universe. So the thing about this d density perimeter is by when time passes, it naturally curves. Okay, that's all you need to know really from what I've all said. We have this way of measuring the, <laughs> the curve of the universe and naturally the more time passes, the more it curves. And if you imagine from the point of Big Bang to the size that the universe is now, the preciseness of, <laughs> if this was completely flat, the preciseness of that in the beginning, from what I understand, just is too precise. It just seems so unlikely that we would find ourselves in this flat universe with Big Bang in, in mind, right? I hope I make sense here. I wish I could be like, any questions? Because I don't really get it either, so help me. But I think, in reality, all we need to know here is that there's a... The horizon problem, two di different parts of uh, the universe are way too like, and the flatness problem, which is that the universe is too freaking flat, dude. It's too flat, my dude. So flat, dude. In comes, to explain this, inflation theory. And it proposes that the universe rapidly I don't know if rapidly even remotely begins to explain just how fast inflation happened. It means that the universe expanded faster than the speed of light from being the most smallest thing we could ever observe to the size of our observable universe in a matter of a fraction of a second. Even fraction of a fraction of a second. Our universe had this incredible, unbelievable exponential growth in such a small period of time. I had never heard of inflation theory before, and uh, in the beginning it was just really confusing because you never heard about it, right? What the fuck? What is this cosmic inflation shit? Maybe they teach kids this in school now, but uh, here's the cosmic microwave background. Here's where inflation happened. So just a tiny portion of our, our time span in the universe. Inflation. In, imagine instead of the Big Bang, imagine the Big Vroot! Vroot! A Big Vroot! A Big Vroot! I don't know how to explain it. But I think the cool thing about inflation is that, you know, you're taught that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in school, right? But it kind of makes sense that space itself can expand as fast as it wants. There's no rules on space being, being bigger. This is what objects in space can travel. That is the limitation. So, uh, this inflation theory doesn't break any laws of physics and conservation with energy or anything like that. And Alan Guth, who came up with this theory, 
explains it that we normally look at gravity as some sort of attraction with objects, uh, interstellar objects, you know, uh, attracting and swinging each other around. But it, gravitation can also be repulsion. So what he says is that the universe was uniform. They had the uniformity before inflation took place. And uh, it was flat before inflation took place, which makes sense. It would make way more sense that in the beginning it was flat anyway. And then from this tiny, tiny universe, this is so weird to think about, it then inflated to the observable universe that we have today. And it sounds sort of fanatical and crazy, and I kind of don't even know if I believe it, to be 100% honest. But there has been evidence of uh, inflation theory with uh, quantum fluctuation ripples or some shit like that. I don't really get it. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> There's evidence of inflation in, while monitoring the CMB is basically all I'm going to say about it. And it sort of beautifully explains these two problems. Uh, inflation theory also creates the reason why I'm making this video to talk about multiverse theory. It creates a problem, which is the fact that it, once inflation starts or almost all version that explains inflation eventually leads to that there's no reason that inflation should stop. And here's where I get, honestly, I get kind of confused and I'm going to try my best to explain the way I understand. If anyone want to help me in the comments, I would love it. <laughs> so from what I gather is that this gravitational repulsion comes from a certain state of mass. And this mass is very uh, is unstable and it can decay randomly like a radioactive substance or something like that. So it starts decaying, but by the time it has decayed in, in certain patches, it has already increased in size larger than itself. So this decaying mass is like a local Big Bang, which means that our Big Bang is one out of infinite Big Bangs. Inflation is just... Oh, another... Eh, decay? Pff, Big Bang. <laughs> Hello, I'm explaining this. Inflation, okay? Imagine this shit. Keeps going. Inflation, 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 inflation. Local Big Bang. <laughs> Are you asleep? <laughs> what is this video? <laughs> Why did I? Oh god. Okay. Anyway, I think what's cool about inflation uh, or internal inflation is that it's scientists looking at how universes are created. Uh, what happens before. Apparently, this is the level 2 multiverse and how it's made. And the other ones could even defy... Not the fire our laws of physics, but they could have different laws of physics based on how the universe is created. Uh, there's a bunch of details on this that it gets way too complicated for me to understand. But the general principle is that the problem with inflation theory is well accepted and well understood. But if you accept inflation, you also kind of have to in accept eternal inflation. And if you accept eternal inflation, since something is eternal and can eventually lead to a Big Bang, that means it's infinite Big Bangs. Uh, I read somewhere that Stephen Hawkins, like a couple years ago in his one, one of his last... I didn't really read into it, but I think he was disputing this idea of eternal inflation. And it's still a, um, a more controversial piece of multiverse theory than the first one, for example. But to summarize, multiverse level two. Inflation, vroom, the big vroom, never stop, vroom, vroom, keep making other big bang, vroom, 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 vroom. that's all you gotta know baby, you understand? Great, now we're going to level 3 Edgar, and holy shit, okay, level 3 blew my fucking mind, okay, it's so weird, and so awesome, and I don't believe it, I don't believe it Edgar. So to understand level 3 multiverse, you have to understand a little bit of quantum physics, which I don't understand. A famous Nobel Prize physicist said that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics, which is just a play of, of making you understand just how weird quantum physics is. But all you need to know, really, is that quantum physics is describing the smallest parts of our universe, atoms, electrons, pro uh, protons, yeah, protons, molecules and whatnot basically what creates everything around us right our building blocks of our universe and as far as i understand <laughs> in quantum physics you describe things with as waves and in comes this wave function okay 
To me, this is really weird and no one... I felt like someone just skipped like 50 parts of something. So you're telling me we can't depict an electron as a particle, but we depict it as a wave? What the f*** does that mean? So this wave function is a mathematical function to describe the probability of where we can find an electron, for example, or a quantum particle. Nothing is precise when you're talking these tiny, baby, 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 tiny, small things. So we have to use this probability wave function, right? That makes sense to me. But what we can do is use this wave function to get fairly accurate results, even though it is probability. But from what I understand is that we don't know if the wave function is real because no one's ever seen it. It's just a mathematical way to describe an electron. And they did an experiment on it that is mentioned apparently all the time to the point where people are sick of hearing about this experiment. But I totally understand because this is this experiment, the double slit experiment, probably the strangest thing I have ever heard about. And I can't believe I've never heard about it. And if you've never heard about it, what a pleasure it is for me to, to explain it to you because it's the weirdest fucking thing I've ever heard. It's so weird. So I actually do remember in school learning about waves and lights, light particles a little bit. So I looked it up. So Thomas Young in the 1800s was trying to determine light. Okay, what is light? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? Apparently there was a whole dispute between uh, Newton and this guy. They butted heads. No, it's uh, light is a particle. No, light acts like a wave, right? So Thomas Young did an experiment where he sh shone a light through a slit and on the back wall of where he shone the light an interference pattern showed up and an interference patterns can only really occur if waves are interfering with each other I don't know how to explain this better than just showing a picture so you have light waves they pass through this barrier and then it's kind of like water waves I guess two drops in water they both interfere with each other and it creates this sort of striped pattern at the wall. You probably know about this in school because for some reason I remember this in school. But all you really need to know is that the light wave passes through both of these slits. It interferes with each other and it creates this pattern. And it's, this can only really occur since it's a wave and it passes through both of the slits at the same time. Okay? That's all you need to understand here. So Thomas Young observed this and was like, ah! Light, it's waves. Got him. Got him, I proved it. Later on, what Einstein realized was that, no, actually, what the fuck? Light can be both particles and waves. I remember learning this, and I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> Think about it, how can something be two things at the same time? It makes no fucking sense. So, what these motherfuckers did, is they did an experiment on it. And they should never have done this experiment. <laughs> I'm joking. But it just, it's sort of like testing a paradox. You know, how can things be two, th two things at the same time? And I think that's the thing with quantum physics is that it just doesn't make sense like that. It, an electron can be in an excited state and in a low energy state or whatever it's called at the same time. Quantum particles can, can be two things at the same time. And that's just a weird thing to try and wrap your head around. So they actually tested this, which I think, I don't know, it just blows my mind with the double slit experiment. And if you already heard about it, yeah, roll your eyes, whatever you heard about it a thousand times, good for you. But uh, basically what they did is they, I don't know how, because they must have been extremely tiny, right? They did this double slit experiment, but they did it with electrons. And electrons, particle, right? But we describe it as a wave function. So now we're gonna find out what is an electron? Is it a wave? Is it a particle? Uh, because this wave function has been so far an excellent way to describe an electron. Uh, but now we will see in reality. So if you picture this double slit experiment, what you imagine will happen when you shoot... Let's say these dots aren't electrons. Let's say they are a bunch of eggs. You're throwing eggs through two slits in a wall and you expect to find the eggs smashed on the wall in this type of pattern. Not in the middle because it's covered up in the middle. This pattern makes sense. Throw egg. They hit the, hit the wall. Okay. What happened, however, with the electrons is that it created this interference pattern where we actually have eggs in the middle, or electrons, rather. Which is weird, that shouldn't happen. Unless electrons act like a wave. So, 
As far as I understand, when the electron hits the wall and when you see it on the wall, that means that the wave function it has collapsed. So the electron no longer acts like a wave, but has now become a particle. And that's why you see it at the back of the wall. Does that make sense? It's sort of imagining that ignore these dots here and imagine a wave. It's a wave, it's a wave, electron is a wave, and then it hits the wall, it's a particle. That's the wave function collapsing. Because when they did the test, the electron acts like a wave passing through the thing, otherwise it wouldn't be able to make this pattern. It's a wave, it's a wave, it's a wave, it's a wave, hits the wall, wave function collapses, it's a particle. Does that make sense? I think I explained that pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's what that looked like, right? But what then you could say is, okay, well, maybe they're just shooting, you know, they're... Pew, 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 pew. Okay, I'm throwing in just like fucking crazy. Or particles. So what you could argue is that, well, the only way for this to happen is if an electron passes through... One electron passes through both the slits at the same time. How can one object be in two places at the same time? It don't make sense. It don't make sense. It's dumb. I don't even want to think about it. So the theory was that, okay, well, it, you know, you're shooting a bunch of elect electrons through, you know, they're probably interfering with each other, okay? They're not passing through at the same time, you dummy. They're just uh, interfering with each other, creating this pattern. So what they did with this experiment, which is really f***ing crazy, is that they shot them really slow, like... Electron. Electron. So there's no way that two electrons could interfere with each other. Guess what? The interference pattern still showed up. Boom. Crazy, right? This is fucking crazy. This is some sci-fi shit. How did that happen? Guess what? It gets so weird. I can't- I don't even want to say it. So what they did was- Okay, well, alright. Cool. How the f*** does that happen? <laughs> I'm sure this is how the scientists said it. <laughs> let's- you know what? Let's add an observer. Let's add a light that detects which one of these slit the electron is passing through. So we can understand how, what the fuck is happening here. How is this electron acting like a wave? We're gonna add an observer and we're finally gonna understand how can this electron act like a wave and be a particle at the same time. We're gonna have the proof. We're gonna get it now. We're gonna get that stupid electron. What happened? It's a particle now. You add an observer, the electron acted like a particle. That's just fucking dumb. That's just so dumb. Quantum physics is so fucking dumb. How? So just by adding an observer to an electron, the wave function collapsed as soon as it was observed, as opposed to when it hits the wall. So adding an observer to an electron collapses the wave function. Basically, an electron acts differently depending if it's being observed or not. What? What? I guess it's, it is a bit of a fallacy to assume that an observer is something passive. Because when you're looking at things at such a small level, just by saying, okay, I'm just looking at you, I'm not doing anything, you're still in a way interacting with it by observing with, with the electron. I think at least. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that makes sense in my head. When you say an observer to an electron, it kind of makes you go, wait, well, they shouldn't change, I'm just looking at it. What is it, an anime schoolgirl being shy? Come on, what are you, a wayward particle? I don't get this shit. So, you know, why does the wave function collapse when it's being observed? And there's a lot of theories behind this. And there's probably better ones, and I didn't look into all of them. But the reason I'm making this video is to talk about multiverse theory. And one of the ways to explain, and it, you know, as crazy as it sounds, a way to actually explain why the wave function collapses is to look into multiverse. And uh, it says that quantum physics doesn't apply to just one universe, but many multiverses. The electron's A's to describe the wave function is in all of these spots at the same time. But once we observe it, we know which universe we are in, and that's when the wave function collapses. So you don't know which universe you are in until you observe it or make the measurement. So each universe has a copy of each particle. Does that make sense? I think it doesn't make sense. It, do it shouldn't make sense. So you probably heard about the Schrodinger cat experiment where with exact same principle where you have a radioactive material that randomly decays. So by probability of quantum physics, uh, the cat inside a box will die or live depending on uh, this random chance of probability. But we don't know the outcome until it's being observed in the same form of... of it's sort of a way to put this uh, collapse of the wave function to our scale, where we don't know 
it's two things at the same time until we observe it. An electron is a wave and a particle until we observe it. The Schrodinger cat is both alive and dead at the same time and it's theoretically possible until we observe it. So a way to explain this, and I think it's an easier way to understand multiverse, is that the cat lives in one universe, the cat dies in another universe, and we don't know which universe we are in until we look inside the box. It's the same sort of principle. So this sort of opens up the door that our universe is constantly being split. We're splitting our universes depending on and creating infinite copies of infinite outcomes. And it opens up the idea that anything that is possible within the realms of physics is possible. So there's another universe where uh, I am still the number one subscribed YouTuber. <laughs> there's another universe where I'm still making hot dogs like I did uh, how many years ago. There's another universe where I just um, decided to finish uh, university. I don't know. All these sort of, you know, roadblocks that you can ma imagine with your own life. That each of these possibilities and each of these universes exist according to the many worlds theory that explains the quantum wave function collapse. 42 minutes. Simon will cut it down. I hope I did a good job. I don't think I did, but I tried my best. I find this so fascinating. Dude, why would you want to believe in all this other sh** that people make up about, you know, dumb sh**, right? There's so much cool stuff that we can theoretically think about, about our universe. And I think uh, what's fun about this is uh, not just understanding that it's possible, but kind of at least in some matter. Obviously, we don't know the math, I, I don't at least. But in some capacity, understanding how it works. To me, it's just fascinating. And uh, I just had a lot of fun uh, collecting all this information for myself. And I just wanted to share it with you guys, basically. So that's what this video is. If you enjoyed it, let me know. Smash like, subscribe, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Purpose. You thought it was gay. But true relevance never really died. Welcome to the first undead game! Use any item in your inventory and make memes inside Tuber Simulator. Add some of our patented stickers in there. Stickers are emotions. Memes are emotions. Express your emotions with me! Share them for likes. Share them for love. Get up for free! And who knows? Maybe I'll review your memes. The greatest honor of all time. Full circle, baby! Download it! Make a meme! <laughs> we need subtitles on this.